Lesson 10.1, Part 1, Evaluating Limits by Direct Substitution. Now, before we start to get into the meat of our discussion about limits, I want to take a moment to make one last preview comment about uh, what this is all leading up to uh, and the two main goals of calculus. Uh, one major goal of calculus is to determine how fast an object is moving. The other major goal of calculus is to figure out how far did the object travel. Now the specific skills that we're going to look at in calculus to address these two questions have to do with finding the slope of a curve and finding the area under a curve. Now previously in one of the introductory videos that you uh, would have watched before watching this video, uh, you were informed that there are three major pillars of calculus, the derivative, the integral, and the limit. Now the slope of the curve, that's the derivative. The area under the curve, that's the integral, but you may notice there's missing a uh, theoretical third goal here, and that has to do with limits. Well, limits are the foundation of both of these goals. Where the, uh, the uh, calculus is a party, uh, which is full of derivatives and integrals, the limit is the bouncer. You cannot discuss a derivative, you cannot discuss an integral, without first getting through the concept of the limit. Now, uh, I'm gonna take a, a closer look at goal number one to point out what I mean by the requirement of the limit in order to discuss the slope of a curve. Now, in calculus, we often refer to the slope of a curve as the tangent problem. We have the tangent problem, which is goal number one, and we have the area problem, which is goal number two. And again, I'm just going to focus in on goal number one as our bridge to this introduction to the concept known as the limit. Consider, what is the slope of a line? Now, of course, this is a, a simple algebra one question. Here's a line. Here's two points on that line. Take a moment. Calculate the slope of this line. Hopefully it wasn't too much trouble for you. You recall that slope is the measure of the steepness of a line, and we can calculate that steepness by using the slope formula. If we simply remember rise over run, rise is the change in y, run is the change in x. Now in calculus, we uh, often use this fancy notation, delta y over delta x. Delta, that's this little uh, triangle right here. That's actually a Greek letter. Uh, the Greek letter delta in math and science, we often use to represent change. So this literally says the change in y over the change in x. In other words, rise over run. The change in y would be seven minus three, just taking the uh, second y value and subtracting the first y value, the change in x would be 5 minus 2. So we get a slope of 4 thirds. Calculating the slope of a line is not a calculus question. Calculating the slope of a line is essentially trivial to the calculus student because we've been doing it since Algebra 1 or earlier. Now on the other hand, what is the slope of the curve? Notice I have the same two coordinates, 2, 3, and 5, 7, but now I'm asking you for the slope of the curve. And this is the point where in the history of mathematics, we get a hard stop. This question is so much more complex than the previous question. Now let's start with the idea that the word slope actually doesn't belong here. Slope, as I said previously, is defined as the steepness of a line. So when I ask you what is the slope of a curve, that question makes no sense. That's like asking what is north of the North Pole. That question makes no sense. So when I ask you what is the slope of the curve, what I'm actually asking you is what is the slope at a point on the curve. And the thing about the slope at a given point on the curve, well, it depends on what point you pick. For instance, if I pick this point right here, what I can actually do is draw what's known as a tangent line. That's a poorly drawn tangent line. But imagine a line that goes through just that single point. We would call that line a tangent line. A tangent line is a line that touches a curve at exactly one point. Now I can measure the slope of that tangent line, and we can then use the slope of that tangent line to represent the slope at that point. Now what if I were to draw a tangent line up here? Well the tangent line up here would be way steeper than the tangent line down here. So the steepness down here is much less than the steepness up here. And if I were to keep going, if pick any random point on the curve, you're going to have a slightly different steepness or a slightly different slope to that tangent line. So when I ask you the slope of a curve, I'm actually asking you an infinite set of different questions at that point, because the curve has a different slope 
for every point along that curve. Whereas a line backing up, no matter where I measure the slope of the line, if I measure the slope across the entire line, or if I measure the slope here or here, or measure it here, the slope is going to be the same at every uh, uh, for every pair of points uh, along that line. The thing about a line is the slope never changes, but with a curve, the slope is constantly changing. So that becomes a much more complex question. Now let's take a closer look at that question by looking at a uh, visual aid that I've created. So here's the graph of the function y equals x squared. All right. And I'm going to pick uh, two points on this uh, graph. Uh, here I have a point at 1, 1, and here I have a point at, looks like about 1.7 comma 3.1 or 3.2. All right, and I can move those points up and down. Uh, I'm going to leave 1, 1 where it is, uh, but I can move this point up and down. Now this line right here is called a secant line. A secant line is a line that crosses a curve in two locations as opposed to a tangent line crosses a curve in only one location. Now, if I measure the slope of the secant line, that gives me an approximate slope of the curve over that particular interval, but it doesn't give me the exact slope of the curve because again, the slope of the curve is constantly changing. Now what I've done is I've measured the delta x and the delta y of this particular curve. Notice as I move it up, move it down, uh, the line itself is getting steeper as I move the point up, and it's getting less steep as I move the point down. And over here, m sub 1, that would be the slope of the secant line, 2.767, which is the ratio of delta y divided by delta x. All right, as I move it up, again, the line gets steeper, so the slope is increasing. As I move it down, oops, as I move it down, uh, the uh, slope is decreasing. Now the question uh, uh, I posed was, uh, how do I calculate the slope at a point? Well, notice, as I move this upper point closer to that lower point, the secant line approaches what's known as the tangent line. Notice here's the tangent line. Uh, and as I said before, if I move the, tan if I move the uh, point of tangency, up, the tangent line increases in steepness. As I move that uh, point of tangency down, the uh, tangent line uh, decreases in steepness. So for every point on the curve, the uh, slope is going to be a little bit different. All right, now let me go ahead and put that right back where it was at 1, 1, turning on that secant line again. As I move the point up, the secant line gets uh, uh, further away from the tangent line, but as I move this point down, closer to this other point, uh, the secant line approaches the tangent line. Now, as I get closer and closer and closer, the slope of the secant line gets, slow, gets closer to the slope of the tangent line. Now, at a certain point, if I put these two secant line points right on top of each other, then the secant line becomes one with the tangent line. It becomes exactly the same line. Therefore, I could say that the slope of the secant line would match the slope of the tangent line, and I now have the slope of the curve at that particular point. But as you can see, we've got a problem. At the point where the two points become one point, the slope is undefined. So is that to say that the tangent line has no slope? Well, actually, no, the tangent line does have a slope. We all see there is there exists a tangent line, therefore it must have a slope. But the problem is, when I put the two points right on top of each other, uh, the delta x and the delta y both become zero. The change in x is zero, the change in y is zero. Because, there's, because the two points are right on top of each other, the difference between the two coordinates is exactly zero. So what we end up having for our slope is zero over zero, which is not something that can be calculated. You cannot have zero in the bottom of a fraction. So when I put them right on top of each other, again, let's try it again, I get nothing. Nothing's there, zero over zero. I get exactly no information about the slope. Again, that doesn't mean that there is no slope. No slope is an entirely different concept. It's saying that I can't figure out what the slope is. The slope exists, I just don't know what it is. Now, if I zoom in a little closer, move those two points uh, uh, away from each other again. 
All right, now let's take a, a close look at that slope. Notice it looks to be a little, cl uh, pretty close to two. As I move the points away, it gets further away from two. Uh, as I move the points closer to each other, it gets closer and closer and closer to two. Again, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit further. The closer I get those two points, the closer the slope gets to two. Zoom in a little closer, the closer I get those two points, the closer the slope gets to two. Yet when I put them right on top of each other, oop, past it. When I put them right on top of each other, it's undefined. Now notice if I go the other way, the slope is now a little bit less than two. Moving them further away, a little bit less than two, but now move them closer to each other. And right at the point where the two points become one and the secant line becomes the tangent line, a little bit closer, Oop, there, just pass right over it, all right? Hopefully you can see though, that at the point that the secant line becomes the tangent line, the slope is undefined, but on either side, it looks like the slope is getting closer and closer to two. And that's where the concept of the limit comes into play. When I can't evaluate something at a particular location, what I can do instead is evaluate the limit as you get closer and closer to that location. That's what the idea of the limit tells me. I cannot calculate the slope of the tangent line using those algebra techniques of rise over run because both rise and run become zero and when I divide zero by zero, I do not get an answer. But if I take the limit as the rise and run approaches zero, what is the intended slope of the tangent line Based on what I see here, I can predict that the slope of the tangent line is actually going to be 2. And I've actually already calculated it. Uh, if I uh, take a look at this, if I do m sub 2, uh, m sub 2 is the slope of the tangent line, and it actually is exactly 2. Uh, and I calculated that using calculus techniques. Instead of using algebra techniques, which hit a dead end when we talk about slope at a point, Using calculus techniques, which we're not going to talk about this year, but you'll talk about next year, you can actually calculate the slope at a point and actually get an answer. But those calculus techniques require the use of something called a limit. So let's finally take that deep dive into the concept known as the limit. So what is a limit? A limit is the intended height of a function. And notice you may, uh, uh, I have this uh, as an informal definition. The formal definition of a limit is uh, super complex. I think it's needlessly complex, especially for uh, an introductory course. Uh, if you're ever interested in the formal definition of a limit, it's something called an epsilon delta definition of a limit. You may see it pop up in a college level calculus class. Uh, but for our purposes, I just need a, a rough estimation of the concept of the limit in order to get uh, uh, things done that we're going to be doing in this class. So I'm going to give you this informal definition of limit, and that is the intended height of a function. Not the height of the function, but the intended height of a function. Now anytime I refer to height of a function, I'm talking about the y value of any given coordinate. x is horizontal, y is vertical, and height is a vertical measurement. So the intended height of a function or the intended y value of a function. Let's look at a graph to uh, describe what I mean by that. Here's just some randomly drawn graph. Uh, first question, what is f of 1? Look at the graph, think to yourself, what is f of 1? Remember, f of x is function notation, so 1 represents the x value. So if I look at x equals 1, f of 1 would be the y value that corresponds to x equals 1, which is this point right here, and the y value would be negative 1. Likewise, evaluate f of 3. Given the graph, I'm going to look at x equals 3. Here's x equals 3, and then I'm going to find a point on the graph that corresponds to x equals 3, and its y value would be 2. This is me using a graph to evaluate functions. f of 1 is negative 1, f of 3 is 2. The coordinate on the graph at x equals 1 is exactly 1, negative 1, and there's another coordinate on the graph at 3, comma 2. These are referred to as the actual values of the function. But new question, what is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x? So that's how we would read that statement. LIM is my abbreviation for limit, the limit as x approaches 3. So the x arrow 3 is read x approaches 3 of f of x.
Now recall what I set up here, a limit is the intended height of the function. The actual height of the function at x equals three is two, but I'm asking what's the intended height of a function. The way we measure the intended height of the function is we don't look at x equals three, we look close to x equals three. So notice here's x equals three, here's x equals 2.9, 2.8, 2.7, and so on. So as x approaches three from either side, here's x equals four, 3.9, 3.8, 3.7, and so on. I look at the graph as x approaches three, to what height is the graph headed? Well, this is not a trick question. Sometimes the uh, hardest questions are the easiest questions. The height, the intended height of the function at x equals three is actually two. Here's the thing about intention. Sometimes when I intend to do something, I actually do it. Consider if I want to go to McDonald's and I intend to go to McDonald's and I exit my uh, house and walk down the street and I go to McDonald's and I end up at McDonald's, not only was my intended destination McDonald's, my actual destination was, was McDonald's. That's perfectly fine. So in this case, the limit as x approaches three of f of x is two, which is the same as the actual value of f of three. But consider this situation. Here I have a hole in the graph at x equals three. So if I ask you what is f of three, we can't say two because there's a hole in the graph. So what we would do is we would just say f of three is undefined. A hole is an undefined point in the graph. It is a point of discontinuity. So in this case, the limit becomes much more interesting because f of three is undefined. I can never actually reach the value x equals three. But a limit is not asking me what the actual value is, it's asking me what the intended value is. Again, I intend to go to McDonald's. I walk out of my house, I walk down the street, I intend to go to McDonald's. But when I get there, I find out, oh, it burned down in the middle of the night. I can never actually reach McDonald's because it no longer exists. But that does not change the fact that I intended to go to McDonald's. So in this case, the limit as x approaches three of f of x is still two because that's the intended value. If I look at the graph near x equals three, I'm intending to reach a height of two. I'm intending to reach a height of two. Can I ever reach that height of two? No, because the graph doesn't exist once I actually reach that height. But that does not change the fact that I intended to go to a height of two. So the limit, even though the graph doesn't exist, the limit does exist at a height of two. What about this one? Notice, same as before, we have a, a hole in the graph, but we have another point that's been redefined at x equals three down here at y equals one. So if I asked you what's the height of the graph at x equals three, the actual height is one. F of three is one, it's not two, it's one. But if I ask you what's the intended height, well, the intended height is actually two. Consider, I walk out of my house, I intend to walk to McDonald's, I get to where I intend to go and McDonald's burned down in the night and they happen to rebuild it next door. I didn't have that information when I left my house. I intended to go to the McDonald's that burned down in the middle of the night. The fact that they rebuilt the McDonald's next door has nothing to do with my intended destination. When you're evaluating a limit, you should be able to completely cover up the actual destination. Without any evidence of what, where I'm actually gonna end up, it looks like I'm going to a height of two. The intended height is the question, not the actual height. The fact that the actual function is at a height of one when x equals three is completely irrelevant to the intended height of the function. So in this case, the actual value and the intended value disagree, which is perfectly fine when it comes to the idea of a limit. So let's summarize what we have so far. Looking at that first version of the graph that I gave you, uh, sometimes I like to call this a well-behaved function. A well-behaved function is a function that does exactly what it intends to do. In this case, the function value at x equals three was two. The limit as x approaches three was also two. The limit and the function value are the same. 
a well-behaved function is a function where the limit and the function value are exactly the same. The limit as x approaches a of f of x is actually f of a. The intended height and the actual height are the same. Another word we give to these well-behaved functions is continuous functions. If a function is continuous, then it is well behaved. If a function is continuous, then the intended height and the actual height will be the same. It's when we have discontinuities that we have disagreements between the intended and the actual heights. So that's gonna be our major uh, idea that we wanna get out of this concept of the limit, or at least the first major idea that we wanna get out of this concept of the limit, is that if a function is continuous, then the limit and the function value will be the same. And we can use that idea to help us evaluate certain types of limits. So let's take a look at that. If a function is continuous, then the intended height and the actual height are gonna be the same. So we call this evaluating limits by direct substitution. As long as a function is continuous, then we can simply evaluate a limit by evaluating the function. Just take the x value, plug it in, whatever answer you get is the answer because it was a continuous function. Consider 3x squared minus two. This is the graph of a polynomial. We know from earlier in this course that polynomials have domains all real numbers. There are no discontinuities on polynomial graphs. Thus, 3x squared minus 2 is a continuous function, which means we can evaluate that limit by direct substitution. I'm going to directly plug in x equals 2 into the function. Notice the notation. When I evaluate the limit by plugging in x equals 2, I stop writing the uh, notation lim because I have performed that operation. Think of a limit as an operation. Once you perform an operation, stop writing that operation. So I simply replace x with 2 and evaluate, and I get 10. Final answer. The limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared minus 2 is 10. Now, if I look at the second one, here we have a rational function. Now, again, earlier in the year, we learned about domains of rational functions. These do have an opportunity for domain restrictions. Anytime the denominator equals zero, we have an opportunity for a discontinuity. Now, in this case, the denominator equals zero at x equals three. Good news, I'm not asking for the limit as x approaches three, I'm asking for the limit as x approaches negative one. As long as the function is continuous at the intended destination, we can evaluate using direct substitution. So if I simply plug in negative one, I get four over negative one minus three, which is negative one. So the limit as x approaches negative one of four over x minus three is negative one. The intended height is the same as the actual height. And finally, the square root of x plus 9, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 9. Square root functions, we know that their domains uh, require that the interior of the square root, x plus 9, be positive. If I plug in 0, I am going to get a positive value, which means my intended height and my actual height will be the same. Final answer, the limit as x approaches 0 of x, square root of x plus 9 is 3. But what about when direct substitution doesn't work? Let's take a second look at question B and question C. So instead of taking the limit as x approaches negative 1, let's take the limit as x approaches 3. Again, 4 over x minus 3, I know, has a domain restriction at x equals 3. So what happens when I take the limit as x approaches 3? Well, let's still apply direct substitution. If I plug in 3, I get 4 over 0, which again is something I expected. I cannot evaluate this function at x equals 3 because if I plug in 3, I get 0 on the bottom. And as we all know, 0 on the bottom is against the rules in our universe. You cannot have 0 as the bottom of a fraction. 4 divided by 0 is undefined. So then what do I say is my answer to the limit? Well, the limit is the intended height of a function. This function is undefined. And based on my background with this function, I actually know that this function has a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. Not a whole, a vertical asymptote. Whereas with a whole, you can clearly define what the intended height was. But with a vertical asymptote, you have to imagine the graph is going up and down forever on either side of that asymptote. So when I ask you what's the intended height, well, it's going up forever. It's going down forever. Therefore, there is no specific intended height. There is no limiting value of this function. So when you evaluate a limit by direct substitution and you get an answer that's undefined, what you can then say is that the limit does not exist, or D and E for short.
Anytime you're evaluating a limit, start with direct substitution. If you get an answer, you're done. That's your answer. If you don't get an answer, for instance, if you get undefined, then we say that the limit does not exist. All right, and finally, let's take another look at question number C. Uh, in this case, instead of evaluating the limit as x approaches 0, this time I'm gonna, going to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 10. But when I do that, negative 10 plus 9 is negative 1, which is not defined on the real number system, so we would end up with the imaginary unit i. But this is not an answer. In order to evaluate a limit, you are restricted to the real number system because, as I said, the uh, uh, informal definition of a limit is the intended height of a function. By using the word height, I'm implying the necessity that this point exists on a graph, and the number i does not exist on the real coordinate system. So limits must be real numbers. So because I did not get a real number as my answer, I'm going to respond the same way I did on the previous one, d and e, the limit does not exist. Evaluate a limit using direct substitution. If you get an answer, great. If you don't get an answer, D and E. All right, here are three more problems. I always like to throw uh, these at you uh, just because it looks complicated, but these are actually even easier than the examples that we just looked at. Given that f and g are smooth and continuous functions and the limit as x approaches 7 of f of x equals 6 and the limit as x approaches 7 of g of x equals negative 6, evaluate each of these limits in turn. Now the first thing I want you to notice is this keyword continuous. And remember what I said earlier, if a function is continuous, then I know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x must equal f of a. Because a function is continuous, I can uh, assume that the function value and the limit value are going to be the same, which means the limit as x approaches 7 of f of x equals 6 implies that f of 7 is 6. Same thing over here, g of 7 would be negative 6. So with that information in hand, let's evaluate each of these other limits, starting with the first one. Limit as x approaches 7 of f of x minus g of x. Well, I can evaluate using direct substitution, just plug in 7, and I get f of 7 times g of 7. f of 7 is 6, g of 7 is negative 6, which means my final answer is negative 36. Yes, it's just that easy. Here's question B. Go ahead and pause here, hit play when you're ready. All right, so f of 7 plus 4 times g of 7, that will be 6 plus 4 times negative 6, which comes out to be negative 18. And the last one, pause here, play when you're ready. All right, plugging in 7, f of 7 over f of 7 minus g of 7, that's the same thing as 6 over 6 minus negative 6, which is 6 over 6 plus 6, which is 1 half. Final answer. All right, take a moment right now to stop here and practice and then move on to the next part of the lesson.